Hello, everybody. Uh, thank you very much for uh, attending uh, these quick lightning 10-minute uh, talks. We have uh, Chris uh, Kordopazi with ICS, and he will be kicking it off. Thank you. Hi, guys. Can everyone hear me OK? Awesome. So my name is Chris, and today I'm going to tell you about a really simple way to create a QML UI that runs on any uh, screen size or resolution. And uh, this talk is going to be for mobile and embedded apps. And we're going to do it using a single set of QML files and a single set of ping files. Uh, before I get into the talk, I have to plug my company real quick. So if you guys do need any help with your Qt application, please uh, contact us at ics.com. So I came off of a project recently uh, that had the requirement to create a UI that is screen agnostic. So <clears throat> many of you may have worked on like embedded applications where you have a single screen size, say 1024 by 768, and that's all you're ever going to ship on. But more and more, we're seeing um, cases where you have to actually run that UI on different uh, widths, heights, aspect ratios, et cetera. So when you hear someone say, I'm, I'm, I'm shipping this embedded device, and it's only going to run this one screen size, be careful, because I've come across a couple real world projects where later on, down, say a year down the, the line, the hardware group or the marketing group comes back and says, you know, we need to run this on a different screen size. And if you've hard coded all your widths and heights and had all the background assets in there, you can imagine that's going to be a big task. So uh, this is this is a method that that I came up with. Um, and if if you look in the Qt docs, there is a page in there uh, that that tries to deal with this issue. It's called scalability. And so at the beginning of this project, I looked through there, and I I didn't frankly find the suggestions in there very helpful. So I had to end up creating my own method. But some of the, the suggestions in that page um, are, for example, uh, use some of the magic numbers that are available to you, like screen.pixel density. And while that does work, it's very slow to test that. Like You'd actually have to load your code on each individual piece of hardware in order to actually see results. So it's going to be really slow to test that. Another suggestion that's made on that page is to uh, load different QML files or different ping files, depending on the screen size or platform. And, yeah, that's a possibility, but that's not really in the spirit of Qt. It's not, it's not in the right once compile everywhere philosophy that, uh, that's been with Qt since the beginning. And I personally don't like maintaining multiple similar copies of code. I don't know about you guys, but that, that drives me nuts. Um, another suggestion that's made in there is to use the Qt Quick Controls 1. And um, if you're doing mobile embedded, that's probably not the best idea. Uh, for a number of reasons. The QQIC Controls 1, as Lars mentioned this morning, is was designed for desktop. So you really shouldn't be using it on mobile or embedded. Um, so they're good for mouse and keyboard apps with the window manager, where each app is in its own, its own window. Um, they're, they're good for if you don't need to be 100% pixel perfect, because the QQIC Controls 1 um, are not 100% stylable. So for example, like the combo box drop down is not fully stylable in Qt Quick Controls 1. Um, they're, they're good for if you're doing old school Windows, Mac, Linux themes, which no one pretty much does anymore. Um, and actually, it's that theming that makes them have performance problems that are, that are known. And the reason that the Qt Quick Controls 2 came about, which I'm actually not going to talk anymore about in this talk, because I actually haven't had a chance to look at the Qt Quick Controls uh, 2. There is a talk later on today on those if you do want to more, uh, know more about them. Another reason not to use them on mobile embedded is that they don't necessarily have the correct resizing behavior for mobile embedded. So if you look at what I've got here, this table view that comes out of the Qt Quick Controls 1, if I make that table view larger, it does what you'd expect on a desktop, right? It makes the window bigger. But this is not what you want in a mobile embedded. Mobile embedded, if you're going from a small screen to a large screen or like a retina display, you actually want the text to get larger and the zebra striping to get larger so that it actually adapts to the larger screen size. So enough about what not to do. So let's start talking about what you should do. So the first thing you have to do is make sure your designers are on board with a flat design, which they probably already are, because that's what's in these days. If you go back a few years, uh, though, that wasn't always the case. So when the first iPhone came out in 2008, I think, um, it, it uh, had a skeuomorphic design, meaning everything was very realistic, very detailed. If you look at this on button, on the left there, you see that the background's got this leather texture to it. It's very asset heavy. 
This is this makes it very difficult to scale the UI. So um, on the right, you know, when Windows 8 came out, everything kind of went to this flat design, and it's it's a lot easier to scale this this type of uh, UI. And the reason is because you can programmatically draw this entire button. You don't need any assets from from designers or anything. You can just write code to render that, and it makes it really easy to scale that. Um, so next thing, since we're not using Qt Quick Controls here, you have to build everything from primitives. So I said this was a simple method, not necessarily, uh, not you know, it's it could still be labor intensive. So you, instead of starting with higher level uh, controls like button, checkbox, slider, etc., you have to go down a level and build everything from item, rectangle, image, text, etc. You can pretty much build any any of those controls you want from these ten primitives. Not we're ignoring animations here, but just to get the basics going. Um, so we're going to build everything from primitives. The next thing, as I kind of already mentioned with the, the flat versus skeuomorphic design, is we want to use as little images as possible in the UI. So use ping images sparingly. Use them only for icons in the foreground. So I just put a sample icon in here. So something like that. But don't, don't use um, images for backgrounds. Use a use a rectangle instead, which my next slide I go through kind of all the things that a rectangle can actually do. Or if you can't do it with rectangle, you can do it with canvas, uh, which is fairly rare that you need to use canvas. Um, make sure your designers are giving you large assets. So if you're working with ping files, you want the assets to be um, their native size on the largest screen that you're going to support, so that basically we're, we're going to scale them down. So if you do, so this, this example code here shows you how, how you scale down an image. If you do end up seeing jaggies, which you may or may not, depending on the screen that you're using, if you do end up seeing jaggies, you can use um, image.mitmap uh, filtering to filter the image and, and smooth it out here. So this, the second one uh, smooths out that image when it's scaled and looks good at any size. If uh, an option to, instead of using ping files, you could use SVG images. Uh, which I, I don't have personally experience with that, but other people do. If you look at this lightning talk from a couple of years ago, um, there was a guy that talks about using SVG images, which which do literally look good at any size. They scale. So as far as backgrounds, um, since we're not using images for backgrounds, what you can do is um, make use of the QML rectangle for your background. So uh, if you're not for for a beginner, you may not know all the capabilities of the QML rectangle, so obviously you can do rectangles and squares, but you can do gradients and borders. Um, you can do circles, rounded rectangles, and what you may not know is you can actually do a half-rounded rectangle or a quarter-rounded rectangle by wrapping the rectangle inside of an item with the clip property set true. So it's essentially this rectangle is going to be twice as high as the, um, as the surrounding item there. So this allows you to do things like tabs or segmented buttons. So most backgrounds that you're going to come across you can do with rectangle. So um, when you go to start building the UI, your designer is going to give you a mock-up. So here's the mock-up. Uh, the first thing that I do is I run QML scene right next to that mock-up and make it the same size. Um, unfortunately, they took out, uh, there's a feature that used to be in QML viewer that used to allow you to reload uh, QML by hitting the F5 key. And if you go into this bug here, um, there's some code I put in there to re reintroduce that feature back into QML scene. So you're, you're basically the idea is here is you're going to be writing QML code, uh, reloading it, and getting it so that it matches the mockup exactly. And um, so this is the main point to take away from this talk is that you want to scale everything in the UI based on the root items width or height. And whether it's width or height, um, it's kind of a judgment call you have to make on a case-by-case -case basis. So for this button, um, you can see here the three highlighted items. For this button, I'm scaling the uh, uh, the border thickness, the uh, image size, as well as the text size based on the height of the root item there. So as I, as I get the item uh, to be taller, it will scale everything. If it's wider, it does not does not scale. So what this means is you, you can't use any constants like this. Like you can't say width equals 100. Um, and consequently, you can't use the Qt Creator Designer 
because the Cube Creator Designer puts in code like this, which is not going to let you scale. And um, I just want to show a quick demo of what this stuff looks like when it's running, so you can get a sense for that. So this is the button that we had. So if I make the button wider, it just gets wider. Uh, if I make the button taller, it scales up. So, so this button's going to run at pretty much any size. So this is what the size it might be on a Retina display. This is what how big it might be on a you know little tiny phone screen. And um, just to get you a, a feel for what it would look like if you put you know a, a number of these types of widgets into a screen, I put these into a, a grid view. And again, I can I can run this at, at any size. So I can run it in portrait. I can run it in landscape, big or small. Um, it still looks pretty good. And uh, I think that's it. So thanks, guys. If you do have questions, um, I'm down in the booth after the talk.